You're listening to Me and Paranormal You with your host, Ryan Singer. It's more fun to believe. Third, third year, year bonus. Because it's a bonus for your third year. Open your third ear and listen to the things you've never heard. Is that serious enough? Hey, everybody, this is Ryan Singer. Welcome to Me and Paranormal You, the podcast. A third year bonus, which means a solo episode. But if you know me, you know there's more than one person living inside this mind. (laughs) That might have been one of them. So, yeah, sorry, I've been um, one episode last week. Did you listen to the interview with Dr. Jeff Durant? Holy smokes, what a fun chat. Did you listen to the week before to Dr. Roger Nelson? Oh my goodness gracious, what a a wonderful conversation with back-to-back. I mean, we've had some back-to-back-to-back-to-back attacks with some really great, great episodes to, to wrap up 2023. And by the way, see you later, 2023. Nice to know you. (coughs) Oh, it's coming back to hit me because I'm talking smack about last year. And between me and you, 2023 couldn't be over fast enough. 2024, let's, let's walk through the door. Let's see what we got here. I'm looking forward to this year. Uh, We are in this year, 2023. Get the hell out of here. Um, don't need to lose as if, if I just don't want to lose friends like I lost last year. Um, not my best year. I would not rank it in my top 10. I, I don't know. I'm 47. So I, I wouldn't even put it in my top 35 of years. 2023, not my favorite year. But we made it, didn't we? We did it. We did it, and we tried to keep a smile on our face as as best we could, even through the hardships and through the trials and through the the tribulations of the year. There were some real high moments. You see everybody's Instagram posts or on social media where they're just they're making slideshows of just the greatest hits of their year. Honestly, I I don't usually do that. I, I try to be grateful and thankful, and I am grateful and thankful for many lessons learned last year, um, uh, great reminders of cherishing friendship and the people in your lives when they are there for you to be there, and also the opportunities and the the graciousness that people have in sharing and opening up their lives to me for this silly, ridiculous podcast. So I appreciate that. I'm very grateful for everyone who shared their story with me. Because quite frankly, listening to other people's stories helps me better understand my own stories. The connective tissue, the story, the archetype of the, the human creature traveling through space and time on a, on a rock that is spinning constantly and also rotating uh, as it spins and then also corkscrewing through space time. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see what astonishing breakthroughs and revelations will, will come to light this year. I am not one of the people who will be presenting these astonishing breakthroughs and revelations. Although here's hot off the press portals might be bastards. Are we, you know me, I think portals are sentient. Do I have scientific evidence in any way, shape, or form to to prove that evidence to you? No, I do think some portals are sentient, meaning they are self-aware and they, they have, you know, potentially personality, which would me which would which would need me to leave, which would lead me to believe that some portals might just be bastards. Some portals are bastards. Can we agree on that? I think we can. So to the bastard portals out there, (laughs) not all portals. Okay. So anyway, lots of fun shows last year, uh, doing stand-up comedy and 
you know, I'm very grateful for audiences and to people who come out to shows. Um, I do have a show in Columbus, Ohio on January 17th. And then I will be in, oh no, actually that's Indianapolis, Indiana on January 17th. And then on the 20, so seventh, so oh God, I, all I had to do is click on a thing and look on my calendar on the 27th. I'll be in Columbus, Ohio, but here's what's exciting. I will tell you this. I'll actually get into some information here for you. If you're listening to this, I mean, who boy, are you meditating? Is this one of your new year's resolutions to be more mindful and be more present to be in the moment of life? That is one of mine and I intend to stick to it. Also flexibility. It's a key to, it's one of the key components of living a healthy lifestyle is being a flexible person. I want to be physically flexible. I want to, and I will be doing more yoga and stretching and listening to my body so I can be more flexible. I've had cramps. I get cramps at the most inopportune times. You ever get a cramp in your foot? You're kind of doing something. Next thing you know, your foot cramps and you're just like, stop everything. Everything must stop. Because my foot feels like it's crumpling in upon itself. It almost feels like, you know, my foot, it's like when a star implodes, you know, into a, um, a black hole. It, it, it feels like there's an implosion happening at the arch of my feet. Like it's crumbling in upon itself, swallowing itself into a negative dark matter space. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to walk again. Am I being too dramatic by having a simple foot cramp when, when I think these things? Assuredly, yes, because they've happened before and I'm sure they'll happen again. But hopefully in less frequent intervals because I will be stretching and listening to my body. I want to be more flexible. And I think having a more flexible body will encourage me to have a more flexible mind psychological flexibility. Dr. Tarrant and I talked about that in last week's experience. If you go back and listen to that interview, we, we touch on psychological flexibility and boy, oh boy, can't we all use a little bit more of that? I want to be able to do the psychological splits. You know what I mean? I want to be able to, be, I want people to be like, when they see how psychologically flexible I am, they might like almost gag on the food they're eating because you know, when you see someone who's just too flexible and you're just like, Oh my God, please stop doing that. That's it seems unnatural how flexible they are. I guess typically that happens when someone's dislocating shoulders and things like that. And then like jumping through their own arms in a hoop or something. You've seen this, uh, probably at Ren fairs or, you know, carnivals, quote unquote, freak shows, things like that. So I want to be psychologically flexible in a way that makes people throw up. That's how flexible I am psychologically. Will I ever get that uh, flexible physically? I doubt it because I don't dislocate joints. Although I do need Tommy John surgery. I'm pretty sure in my left elbow, my throwing arm. That's what we call it in the business. If you're a baseball player. Uh, I'm a lefty, so it's in my left arm, my left elbow. It's my throwing arm. Anyway, I do want to work on my psychological flexibility and my physical flexibility. I want to be in the moment of now, in the present, much more often. I had this conversation with my, my dad today. He asked me, he said, is time, has time sped up for you yet? Which, which I thought was an interesting question. And I knew exactly what he meant. You know, my dad, in case you didn't know, is older than me. And so <laughs> I thought that would be funny. And, it, you know, it turns out it was. So my dad, believe it or not, is older than me. And he asked me today, I was driving him to the airport uh, along with my stepmom. And he said, is time sped up for you yet? And I said, yes, it has, in fact, while simultaneously dragging on uh, in an almost excruciatingly painful way. And what I mean by that is, without trying to get too dark, last year, 2023, felt like it flew by the seat of my pants, like in a blink of an eye. Meanwhile, due to just, you know, losing, you know, there was a lot of death. I experienced a lot of death last year that was somewhat unexpected. And then I also experienced 
you know, oh my God, is this person going to die uh, situations as well uh, with people close to me. So there was a lot of that last year, which made, which made the year feel excruciatingly painful and slow. Meanwhile, simultaneously being gone in the blink of an eye. I can't believe it's already January 2024. I mean, I know we're all probably saying that, but I think the older you get, the more that happens because the less things that, that surprise you maybe or are new. So you've been through this. It's normal so you don't slow down and pay attention as much. It's We've talked about this before, and I think we're all aware of this phenomenon. When you're a child, everything seems new and you're taking everything in. You're in, you're in the moment. You're baffled. You're filled with awe and some whimsy. And I, I need more of that. So I'm a pretty whimsical fellow. You probably already know that about me. If you listen to this show, I am very whimsical to my detriment. Some would argue, and I would say that they, they just don't have enough whimsy in their life to make such a statement, which is also a very whimsical thing to say. So you see, it's the whimsy eating the whimsy. It's a, it's a never ending cycle of whimsy eating whimsy here. So what was the point? The point is, he asked me, does time, has time sped up for you yet? And, and it has. And this is one of the key components to one of my resolutions of being in the moment, being present and being more mindful and having a daily meditation practice, which I've had in the past for long periods of time. And it behooved me to do so. It was good for me. And meditation daily meditation specifically was one of the key components in helping me get through the pandemic uh, at least large chunks of it because i you know it was you know it was hard on everyone and meditation really helped me so i'm going to be doing that more and i mean because let's face it i've had a pretty damn good life and i feel pretty charmed i feel pretty damn lucky as well I also know that I made clear, distinct choices to have the life that I have. And, you know, and I reap the benefit of those choices. Some might call them bold choices. I, to me, they weren't bold choices. They were just the only choice that could be made. I, I was going to live my life a certain way. I was going to pursue, pursue, I was going to pursue, I was going to pursue a certain path as a creative, as an artist. And that's what I, that's what I've chosen to do. And I love it. And I'm, I'm thankful every day that I've made that choice. And I make that choice every single day. I have to, that's a reaffirming of a choice. Every single day has to be made. Pursuing the paranormal and being public about it for a decade has been a choice. And sometimes it's been easy. Sometimes it's been fun. Sometimes it's been difficult and hard. That doesn't change the fact that I I wouldn't have done it any other way. I, I, I love that I've done it this way. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I try not to get caught up in certain things and hey, I'm just a human, but listen, I'm not over here just trying to be a, a million dollar content machine, right? I'm, I'm trying to create a, a body of work and it might, you might think that's audacious. You might be listening to this, but what an audacious fella. And maybe maybe that's not the words you'd be using, but I think that's probably what you'd mean, even if you weren't using those words. That's very audacious of you to think that you're creating a body of work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could post a thousand different crowd work, you know, TikTok clips or Instagram reels. I could go on stage and just do crowd work, not work on material that I've written and crafted in, in, in the art form of stand-up comedy. Uh, just to get views and views and views and views and clicks and clicks. I'm just trying, I'm trying to build a body of work here, uh, you know, when it comes to my stand-up comedy and my, in the art form. Now, it doesn't matter. You have to detach from outcome. So it doesn't matter if that body of work is ever considered good or, you know, people find it, you know, you hope people find it. You want to make, you want to make people laugh. That's the dream. So, yeah, you want to you want to make people laugh. You want to help them maybe forget about their troubles. Now, some stand-up comedy nowadays is not like that at all, is it? It is very different than that. It is, let me tell you, uh, let me try to show you how smart I am. 
I think I am or how edgy I am. And that's fine. People can do whatever they want to do. That's, you know, we all, we all have our own path. So, uh, speaking of our own path, I'm going to be taking this, my own path. Uh, I've got a few trips this month. I'm, I'm looking forward. I'll be back in Los Angeles, uh, for a short spell here in the middle of the month. And then I'll be going to Florida to the infamous location. Let me lay out for you some guidelines and some specifications of paranormal investigating when it comes to the way, um, uh, I don't want to say the way I do things. That's not, that's not how I don't want that. I don't want this to sound like that at all because, you know, I, I came up a certain way. <laughs> I came up a certain way doing paranormal investigating. You know, it's, you are who you, you are who you learn from and you are what you read and learn from and, uh, who you learn from and, and also what you think. And you kind of combine all these things into a modality or a way of doing something. And I'd like to get into that a little bit. So we're going to get into the, the specifics of paranormal investigating in case you're curious about that. I'll go through a list. Uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through some documentation that I have been making for the upcoming investigation. I'm also going to walk you through what I'm doing personally, uh, physically and mentally and spiritually uh, in preparation for what I consider to potentially be the biggest investigation trip of my life. Heading back to the location in Florida where I had the the ever-living life scared out of me to where I still talk to my therapist, Brian, uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, because of the experience I had that on the first time. Now, I will link, hopefully, I will be able to link to this, but the, the, the episode is called My Experience uh, Encounter with a Sasquatch. You can go back and listen to that. It's a 30-year bonus. I recorded it. Uh, about a week or so after my experience, as soon, uh, pretty, pretty quickly, pretty quickly. You can't say that. Let me explain why you shouldn't say, you can say it cause I did say it, but why you should, you shouldn't say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have an adverb L Y on a word after using like a Y word, like pretty quickly. You could say rather quickly, but, uh, you just really don't want to use LYs, apparently. It's a sign of lazy writing. This isn't writing. This is talking. I'm dropping the grammar hammer on myself, and there's no need for it. Let's take a quick break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to lay out how I do paranormal investigations for you, because I don't think I've ever gotten really into the nuts and bolts of this. Um, you know, I'm going to do my best to stick to the script on this. But I'll tell you, I've, been, I've got cabin fever over here. I, you know, I've barely seen people. Since Christmas Day. And it's what, January, early January? Okay, we're going to be right back. Uh, patrons, no commercials. Lucky you. You're going to hear me say, let's take a break for commercials. And then I'm going to be back like two seconds later. But if you're not a patron, you could be. For $3 a month, you could skip all of this commercial BS. But in the meantime... Here's some commercials to keep the lights on. And we're back. So thank you for, you know, fast forwarding or listening to those commercials either way. Um, it's up to you. You just hit the little arrow, jump ahead, I guess. Um, it's pretty painless. That's technology nowadays. Anyway, so let's talk about paranormal investigating. Here's what we're doing. I am kind of, I'm not on the lead on this. I'm the organizer of a return trip to the location in Florida in 2019, the summer of 2019, early summer 2019, where I had a terrifying experience. We compiled an incredible amount of evidence on that trip. Let me walk you through just a short grocery list of some of the evidential pieces. <laughs> I don't even know this is a phrase, but it sounds fun. Let me walk you through some of the evidential pieces that were accumulated during, that were collected during the investigation in 2019. So anyway, this is all part of a document I'm compiling for the team that is going down, which is, as it stands now, upwards of eight people will be in and out at this investigation. 
And yes, we will be documenting it. That is not the number one priority of this investigation, the documentation part. The number one priority is the search for answers for the people who live there. And we're trying to find answers. That is priority number one. Priority number two, let's document it as well. So anyway, so I've, I've got a basically a, a document that's a few pages long. And it lays out objectives. It lays out team members. Um, you know, this is part of this. This also kind of comes from a little bit of the Hollywood, you know, production sheets, the call sheets. Um, you know, there was someone in my life that there was very close to me who's a producer. Um, so I'm very familiar with all the things that are needed on these things. Um, you know, th- this document will include but not be limited to all the people involved, contact information, objectives, itinerary, um, you know, expected weather and or weather events during the time frame. as much as we can predict those this far out. Uh, also local hospital information, uh, emergency numbers and contacts in case something goes wrong. Safety first, always safety first, right? And then uh, obviously within the itinerary, there will be a day by day breakdown. Um, and within that breakdown will, there will be an, a major allowance for flexibility due to phenomena. Like the, the phenomena will dictate what we're, what we end up truly doing. Um, so, and it will also, this document also includes, you know, interesting tidbits of information uh, in a section of in a section that I've called what we think we know. Um, what's fascinating about this location is not only, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to be careful what I say here because it's not my, it's not my story to tell. But let me say it like this. This physical location is very fascinating for various reasons and one of the reasons is the reported uh, existence of multiple portals on the at the location and we know exactly where these portals are and we will be investigating to the best of our abilities but one of the other very fascinating components of this location is it's it's a remote it is a it's not a one horse town but it might as well be where this place is also knowing that it, there is a remote nature to the location there is there's a remoteness inherent the sticks if you will of this place there are multiple people of high interest to me specifically without getting into the details and without even knowing the specifics of these people who have found themselves relocating to this area. And it makes you go, hmm. Makes you go, huh. Makes you go, hmm. <laughs> It makes you make a lot of noises, right? If you couldn't, if you catch my drift. So there's, there's the fascinating components there. This is what we think we know, right? And there's something happening here. Why is it happening here? We think it's tied to the existence of these portals. We also think it's tied to the, to the inherent abilities of one of the people who lives there. Okay. So this is what we think we know. Now, this is what we actually have collected previously in the past. I'm talking about 2019. We cast a large, and when I say large, I mean it was probably, it was easily 12 to over 14 inches footprint on the property. In between the house, which is kind of up on this hill, and then the sugar shack, which is down the driveway, down the hill that winds through the trees just a little bit. We cast a large, large, footprint that was discovered by I believe it was discovered by Dan Butler who will be returning 
with the investigation team uh, here in a few weeks. We found a giant and enormous tree structure that essentially was an entire tree ripped out of the ground, uh, placed into another tree, forming a giant X. X marks the spot. Holy smokes, don't come through here. Not your territory. Could it have been a hurricane-related event? Yes. Nonetheless, it was foreboding and formidable. Never seen a tree structure in my life anywhere close to this. Now, we also found a den. Dan Butler, again, discovers a den. Now, Dan is a former game warden, is highly skilled in tracking animals and understanding this world when it comes to tracking. He knows what animal dens look like. He used to, he used to work in the mountain forest of Lake Arrowhead, among other places. So actually I need to have Dan on the program and do a full on interview. I don't know why we haven't done that because Dan has some of the most incredible Sasquatch footage you will see. And it's his, it's his footage. It's, it's, it's the footage. Anyway, the footage has become his because someone in his family was there when it was was captured it is remarkable it's been on the internet for a hot second maybe it might have been taken down but dan hasn't done anything with it dan has said we can use it in this documentary we can use that footage uh he's all about that i believe so at some point you will be seeing some of the most incredible sasquatch footage i've ever seen Captured on a cell phone camera. We're talking northern, we're talking central California. So we found a den. This den was giant. I, there are photos of me in the den where I'm essentially, I'm kind of, I'm standing up and I'm crouched over a little bit, but plenty of room for me. There, there was room for many me's. Not many, many me's. Wow, you, you, you say a sentence like that and then you start to understand how learning the English language must be a real, a real chore. I'm doing Duolingo right now. You know, not to brag, but, you know, bilingual. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a work in progress because I, I, I mean, I took Spanish classes in college where they, the teacher only spoke in Spanish. And now I just don't. It's been too long. So I'm, I'm reteaching myself Spanish. Uh, anyway, so we've got, we've got a footprint. We've got a giant tree structure. We've got a den. We have incredible wood knocks. And the patrons, if you've been a patron for a minute, you know that you can go back on the, on the Patreon, patreon.com backslash Ryan Singer. You can go through the old posts. I have posted the audio of these wood knocks that were captured at this location on a digital recorder on the inside windowsill of the sugar shack as Ed Brown and I both slept. They are astounding. They are clear as a bell and they quite frankly are terrifying. When you realize what's happening, you realize this isn't just one. This is a communication between, in my estimation, a communication between different creatures that are able to hold sticks and beat them into a tree very loudly. They're coming from different directions and they have different volume. You can tell that they're coming from different places. It's incredible. It's an incredible recording. I implore you, if you're a patron and you haven't heard it, to go back and find that. It's in the, I think there's like 360 posts for the patrons, by the way. So if you've never been a patron and you want to just lose yourself for a month, sign up and 
uh, you can go through 360 different posts. And a lot of those are commercial free episodes, by the way. So that's what we have. We have a footprint that we cast. We have a giant tree structure. We have a den that was not a deer den. We have uh, wood knocks captured. We actually have interesting responses from a spirit box that I was not aware of in the moment, but only once reviewing footage later, Ed Brown discovered some quite, you know, not my favorite responses I've ever heard out of a spirit box when I'm asking questions. And, you know, if you have experience with a spirit box, you know, things are moving so fast. You can't just remember everything that you can't even understand everything that comes out. And I said something along the lines of, is there something you want me to know? And the spirit box immediately responded, I'm inside you, which is a little kind of scary, wouldn't you say? Um, And then later that night, I had my terrifying experience. Is this a coincidence? I don't think there is a coincidence. In this, I'm looking at my clock. It's 11.11 right when I said that. So obviously that's an accentuation point for me. Looking at the clock right now, it's 11.11 p.m. It's not a coincidence that the solo paranormal investigation that was yielding quite a few more responses than I even knew at the moment preceded me opening up a line of communication that I wasn't even sure I opened up. Probably. And led me to my experience of the most terrifying nature I've ever had in my life. So, we also had that. We also have a thermal image of a... I don't know if I've talked about this. I think I probably... There's no way I haven't talked about it. We have a thermal image on a FLIR camera. FLIR is the thermal imaging. It's one of the brands, right? It's like a Sony playstation or a microsoft xbox this is a FLIR thermal camera scope right takes photos and we have the head of a creature (laughs) we have the head of a creature just in the woods or just out in this field that evaded us what happened was we were doing a paranormal investigation at this old abandoned rundown, just rickety, scary as hell, 6,000 spiders cabin. And we were outside. I was trying to summon orbs outside after being inside the cabin. Dan Lindholm believes he sees an orb floating through the field. Then we hear footsteps running away from us. Everyone starts running after the footsteps. Dan Butler has a FLIR thermal imaging camera. He catches a snapshot of the creature's head peeking over a hill down below us. We reenacted this the next day in daylight, and we, through our estimations, this creature had to be upwards of eight feet tall for us to be able to see its head uh, from from where we were and where it was in our reenactment. Also on the FLIR imaging camera, there was a creature on all fours, walking, crawling, whatever, creeping, whatever you want to call it, towards us down this old dirt road on that same neighboring property. Dan Butler went to take a photo of it. Batteries died on the cam on the FLIR. Go figure. There is my experience that I had where the trail camera doesn't pick me up for some crazy reason, but it picks up the flashlight dancing on the side of the sugar shack as I ran for my life up the driveway. The motion sensor activates on that, but not me walking in front of the camera, stopping and screaming. It's just so damn frustrating when something like that just doesn't get captured. It's just like, man, why, oh, why? But yes, I get it. This is what you do, trickster, trickster, et cetera, et cetera. We also have, you know, audio on a digital recorder inside the old abandoned cabin of, it sounds like, uh, uh, sounds like something heavy being moved across the floor when none of us were inside the, the cabin because we were all outside chasing whatever this thing was. Right. So, and there's more, I'm sure that I'm not remembering off the top of my head right now. So this is what we think we know about this location. Now we go back 
here in a few weeks. And we will be there for a week solid, a week solid. We will be doing an investigation inside the home this time, which is different. Uh, you know, last time I did a solo investigation inside the home by myself, but it was just one night for a few hours. This time, one of the primary focuses of our investigation will be inside the house because I think I've probably mentioned on here, if you follow this program in my trips back to the location in over the last few years and specifically this past year, I've been back there twice over the summer, once for six days. All the activity has moved inside the house, apparently, but not. But then as soon as we say that, then there's stuff that happens outside, allegedly. Um, and I've seen some of it. I have some video of some re- very interesting, unexplainable things that we don't exactly know about. One of them is a peeled stick that has been shoved into the ground, a large stick on the side of the driveway. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Not sure who did it or why. But hold on, I need a little bit of nog. So yeah, I'm drinking my last nog of the season. Some Chobani oat milk nog. I made an episode of Nogged Up. I haven't edited it together yet. I'll I'll post that at some point. My last nog of the year. The reason it's my last nog of the year is because I finished off the Chobani. I poured myself a really tall, healthy glass. And it'll be my last eggnog of, of the season. More than likely. Who knows? Stranger things have happened. So, getting back to the investigation and paranormal investigations in general. This is information that I believe is pertinent, so I added into this document about things that have happened in the past, along with an objectives list. It's a two-pronged investigation, inside and outside. We will be focusing on the sugar shack. We will be focusing on the two portals, and we will be focusing inside the home, trying to find answers about who or what exactly is happening inside this house. There have been strange orbs forming on the windows in the house. There have been flashes of light seen moving throughout the house. There have been, in my last trip there, there was a large bang on the roof when Carolyn and I were just hanging out recording stories at like 1230 in the afternoon. Here's the interesting thing about paranormal investigations. You don't have to do them at night. And I was actually on the phone with Ed Brown and also a psychic friend of ours who will be joining us on the trip, hopefully. And we were having this very conversation. And, you know, aesthetically for television, I think people want You know, they're like, oh, it's got to be at night. These night vision cameras, right? Uh, Things just look spookier or creepier at night, I suppose. But some of the best evidence you'll ever get in your life is during the daytime. Uh, I don't think ghosts are on a nap schedule. So, yeah. Anyway, we're going to take another very short little commercial break here. And we're going to get back to it. Uh, When we come back, I'm going to lay out the rest of this investigation along with certain guidelines that go into paranormal investigations, at least, you know, with me and my crew and and the way we do it. And and this isn't the only way to do it. There are many different ways and there's many different styles. And, you know, I'm not over here acting like ours is the right way or the best way. It's just the way we do it. So patreon.com backslash Ryan Singer. $3 $3 a month gets you no commercials. Okay, we're back. And patrons, you you got back a lot faster than everybody else. So thank you very much to all the patrons. I truly, truly appreciate it. Another year in the books, my friends. And I think this show's only going to be getting better because I've got announcements to make. And we'll do that at the end of the show. So this paranormal investigation has upwards of seven or eight different team members. Some of us are more heavily focused in the paranormal field, and some of us are more heavily focused in the wilderness aspects. Uh, There's lots of uh, familiar names, and I'm still waiting on confirmation. There may be some other familiar names coming. 
Uh, but this is who we know for sure. We, you know, my guy, Ed Brown, you know, he's going to be there. You know, my guy, Dan Lindholm, you know, they're going to be there. You know, part of the original crew on the investigation. I mean, I wasn't even part of the original crew at this place. In 2017, they filmed a movie there. Some people did and things like that. Anyway, investigations have been going on there a long time. So Ed, Dan, and then we got Dan Butler, who was there in 2019. We got my buddy Eric Connor, who you know as Epic Paranormal. He will be there. Matthew Jackson. Are you kidding me? Evil Logoville is joining us. One of the world's most foremost ITC device experts is going to be bringing his trunk full of gadgets. Who knows what we're going to crack into. But I will tell you this. I was on the phone with Matthew Jackson earlier this on this very night. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? On this very night, I spoke with him. And I'll tell you, I am like a kid in a paranormal candy store when he was walking me through some, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I hesitate to even say it because it'll sound like such an exaggeration, but I'm not exaggerating when I say what he was walking me through and telling me about and then sending me some example clips from already having used this new equipment that is groundbreaking, next level, next wave ITC devices that is just going to blow people's minds. I mean, my mind was blown in about a six second clip he sent me. I am so damn excited that he is bringing his talents and his collaborations, his creative collaborations that he does with other ITC people. Uh, we can get more into those people at some point soon. Uh, and hopefully I'll be connected with them. And we'll be able to bring them in and chat uh, about some of the stuff here on the show. Because these experiments that he's running with his buddies are just bonkers. They are next level, crazy, bonkers, awesome, incredible stuff. So I'm very excited about that. Then we've got, um, well, you know, that's all I'll really mention right now. We're waiting to hear from my buddy Alex, uh, and we're waiting to hear from, you know, uh, one or two other people who might be joining us. And then I'll be there, you know, just doing whatever it is I do. Just kind of like wondering, hey, am I allowed to eat sugar yet? And that leads me into my next thing. So what are we going to do? in preparation for an investigation such as this. And what I truly believe for, and I'm not trying to overstate this either. This is probably the biggest investigation I've ever gone on because of what happened to me previously there in 2019 and how it forever changed the course of my life and not in a great way. So through three plus years of therapy with a PTSD therapist, and through the, you know, the loving support of my friends and from Bill and Carolyn who live there, allowing me to come back multiple times now, um, we, we are going back to the place, right, where I had the shit scared out of me and it, and it changed where I thought I was going to die. And I've never had a, 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 a you know, what is it, a fight or flight moment in my life that compares to to that moment. And this is the ultimate confrontation of, of such fear. Now I've been back three different times, if I'm not mistaken, one of them for six days. So yes, I've been back and I have faced it to a certain degree. Right. But this time I will be, and we will be as investigators spending the entirety of a night, if not multiple nights, outside in the wilderness at this location. This is something I have to do. Will I, we won't be sleeping. We will be investigating, but that doesn't, that's not, that doesn't mean we're going to be out exploring in the woods. We're going to settle in and see who comes to us. It'll be some sky watching. There'll be some other things like this, but the point is I will be out in the belly of the beast. Oh my gosh. I'm saying it out loud right now is it actually becomes very real because it's just a couple weeks away, really. So the ultimate confrontation of my own fear. And I'm going to put that baby to rest. You know what I mean? I am going to confront it. I'm going to move past it. And th I'm going to move through it 
and past it. I think that's what some people say. So for me, it's that's why I say it's probably the biggest investigation of my life because it's me really fully confront. Now, some people might say, well, to truly fully confront this fear, you need to be outside in the woods by yourself overnight. I do I do I need is that what I need? Is that what I need to do? <laughs> because I said it out loud, does that make it true? Uh, from an imaginary person who's kind of being like, well, you really want to get over it. This is what you do. No, I don't. I don't necessarily think that's the thing. I mean, how often do people just go out and sit in a chair in the middle of the woods all night long by themselves uh, just as normal people? Is that just something we do? No, it's an investigation thing. So, anywho, moving on from that, my preparation for such an event mindfulness, meditation, reminding myself of the things that are true and the things that are real. I was not hurt or injured in any physical way. I do believe I could have been by whatever this thing was that screamed at me from the depths of the darkness on that particular night. It could have harmed me and hurt me physically if it wanted to. Did it? No, it did not. Why? Well, because clearly it didn't have a need to do so. So I'm moving forward with that information and understanding that that's the way it will be. I will not be harmed or hurt by something out here physically. That's just not what's going to happen. That's just not the nature of this phenomena. Now, to terrify and to scare is one thing. To actually hurt, harm, or worst case scenario, kill and or abduct, that's a whole nother level. And I don't think we're dealing with that here. And I have reason to believe that certain things have changed on that property. And uh, we can get into that later at another date, which also might assuage a little bit of uh, a person's fear regarding these kinds of things happening. So in preparation, here's what I will do. And here's what I am currently trying to do and what I am doing, I guess. There is no try. There is only doing, I suppose. It's what I did the first time. The first time I went basically on a pineal gland cleanse diet. So I cut out sugar, I cut out caffeine, and I cut out meat leading up to the investigation to try to supercharge and fully extend my intuition antenna. So I am going to be doing that again. I won't be doing, I think I did it for like a month or something leading up to the last one. I think now over these last handful of years, I understand myself a little bit better for two weeks leading up to, uh, so starting on the 15th or so, and it's tough because I'm doing a lot of traveling in the meantime, and I'll be on the West coast and then I'll be doing shows and in and out of town. So it becomes a little more difficult, but it's still doable. I will be getting off all, all refined sugar, and which is something I try to do anyway, in, just in general in my life. I will be cutting out caffeine leading up to the investigation, I believe. Now, that's a real hard one for me. Uh, at the very least, I'm switching to mushroom coffee, okay? But I will be doing a vegetarian diet uh, leading up to the investigation as well. Now, this is something to, this is just something I do when I really want to supercharge my intuition. And one might be asking themselves very fairly right now, listening to this program. Well, if it supercharges your intuition so much, why don't you live this way? And that is a very good question. And the answer to that is because I love getting jacked up, dude. I love getting jacked and juiced and yacked and cracked, okay? So don't tell me I can't have caffeine because that's how I get juiced. So, and you know, every once in a while I want to have an ice cream sandwich, man. But I don't want to ever get gout. I don't want to be diabetic. You know, these things, I'm 47. I got to take care of my body. So I'm drinking oat milk nog right now. Oh my God, this Chobani oat nog is pretty good. Ah, oh, yeah, it's good. Chobani. When the holy cow has no place. All right. Okay, that's, that slogan doesn't work at all. So anyway, 
I'll be going vegetarian. I'll be cutting out sugar, uh, supercharging the intuition and preparation for the investigation. That's what I'll be doing. I'm also collecting the things you need uh, for the kits you need when potentially collecting evidence on a paranormal investigation. Now, there's different types of evidence collection. Some of them are, you know, photographic, digital, film, etc. That's one way uh, you can collect evidence and you can review that evidence. That's evidence, obviously, you can share with the world, especially if you get something hyper compelling. Other ways are, you know, when you're in the field. And if you've ever watched Expedition Bigfoot, you've seen a little bit of this, uh, or any kind of thing, right? There's, uh, and I can post the document too, uh, one of these documents that I have that is a, uh, that walks you through various different ways of casting footprints, et cetera, when you're, uh, depending on the situation you're in and the, and the cast you need to make with plaster. But we're talking about vials. We're talking about tweezers. We're talking about, you know, rubber, you know, sanitary, dust-free, surgical gloves, evidence envelopes and we are talking about things that you can seal that can be sealed like let's say you find a hair sample and you want to send that off to get tested well you can do that right so but you want to make sure the handling of the specimen is done correctly as to not contaminate the sample so you'll want to get you know single use sanitized you know, not like test tubes or whatever that are, you've been using to like put other stuff in and things like that. Nothing like that. These are, these are very, these are specimen specific, you know, you know, tools and equipment that you want to use solely for the purpose of collecting evidence. Right. So what we'll have is we'll have a, like a giant travel bag, uh, not giant, but you know what I mean? We'll have like a, a carrying case that has all the things you need to be able to collect evidence in the field. Now, there, you know, you might be compelled in situations of finding a den to, you know, collect something from the den, thinking you might get some e, some environmental DNA, right? If you, if you do have the money to send something off and be tested like that, uh, you might also find yourself, you know, wanting to collect Potentially, not that you necessarily have the means for this, soil samples from the location of a portal. Will there be something? Will there be either environmental DNA or will there be, or where, 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 where there'll be, there will be blood, where there will be, maybe, I don't know, trace radiation in the soil is that a thing that you might find at the location of a portal a purported portal a purported portal right so there's all kinds of ways you might want to take evidence mostly if you find a hair right that's pretty wild that's that's when it, things get exciting and then you want to have a plaster kit you just want to have the plaster of paris or whatever you're going to use and, you know, a basic knowledge of how to do it. How thick are you making the, the, the plaster? Well, it depends on the, the attention to detail, the fineness of detail of the print that you're casting. How deep is it into the ground and, you know, things like that. So basically all you need for that is like a spatula, you know, some water and the plaster and, you know, something to mix it in, um, you know, probably a bowl. Although some people kind of maybe just kind of do it on the spot. Anyway, I'm no expert on that. Okay. I mean, for the record, I've never found a footprint myself that I've cast. I've been there at the casting of a footprint at this specific location. I have not cast a footprint uh, up till this time. Uh, and I certainly, certainly intend to at some point. Uh, be casting many, many footprints over the, you know, the next 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, I'll be out in the field when I'm 97, dude. I'll just be out there just like doing fucking Omal calls. I'll be out there, bro. I'm just going to be out there. 90, when you're 97, it's like, what? It's like, come and get me, dude. I'm 97. You're going to scare me? Not anymore. I'm 97, dude. I've been through it. 
You know what I mean? I look like a monster. I'm 97. <laughs> I look like a monster. I'm 97. Did I say that? Uh, I'm going to look great at 97. I'm going to still be doing it, dude. I'm going to still be, and by doing it, I mean life. I don't mean what you think I mean. But hey, that's part of life, so I probably will be. But like, you know, I mean, that's just not, that's not solely my decision, obviously. But when I'm 97, I plan on, you know, walking, swimming, running, hiking, doing all the things, having a milkshake from time to time. I'll probably, I'll probably be more jacked and more ripped than I've ever been in my life by the time I'm 97. Just be the most in shape, fit 97 year old. Check back with me in 50 years. We'll, uh, you know, on episode 9700 of the of the Mindcast. Well, no, let's see. 10 years and I've got over 700. So let's just say 700 a year. So we're talking 50 years. So 3,500. 3, we're talking, we're looking around episode. We're looking roughly at episode 5,000. So by episode, can you imagine if there are 5,000 episodes of this show? Some people probably heard that and they thought to themselves, oh my God, they almost threw up. Like when you see someone be too psychologically flexible and they like jump through the, jump through the dislocated joints of their own mind. Right. Okay. So here's what we're doing. We covered that, right? We covered what I'm doing in preparation for at least my physical diet and I will be doing meditation. I will be setting intention uh, for a bountiful investigation that provides clarity and answers to Bill and Carolyn, uh, first and foremost, and for the safety of everyone involved also, probably first and foremost. Well, can you have two first and foremost? Let's say safety first, answer second. Let's do that because safety first. I think there's a reason why that phrase exists. It's because first, safety. Safety first. You get it. You get it. Why? Because you always have. You get me. That's why you're still listening. You know, I went and I hadn't looked on iTunes in forever. And I just wanted to check. I'm like, how many ratings does this thing even have? Over 400 ratings. And we're like, you know, at a 4.7 star rating, which is great. Thank you so much. And somebody wrote a review that they couldn't listen because I can't stay on track. And I'm like, I can't stay on track. You can't stay on track. By the way, maybe I will get some more eggnog later, but the point is, this Chobani nog, this oat nog is good. See, I know how to stay on track, bro. It's all about the nog, okay? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think this show is? This isn't uh, CSI Amityville. That's a, That's actually, I just came up with a really good show. CSI Amityville. They got CSI Down Under. They got CSI Chicago. CSI, what, Miami Beach. CSI New York City. CSI Los Angeles. CSI Hawaii Five O. They need CSI Amityville. Am I on to something here? Get my manager on the phone. We're going to Hollywood and we're pitching... CSI Amityville. Oh boy. What a fun show that would be. Would I watch it? No. But I would make it. I would take all the buckets of money to make that show. And of course I'd watch it. Why wouldn't I? It's my show. Do I listen to this show? What do you think I'm think I'm a maniac? That I just go back and I listen to myself talk? No, I don't do that. I do go back and listen to episodes, you know, if I'm, you know, when I'm re-interviewing someone, because I'm listening to them, right? I do need to go back and listen to some of these 30-year bonuses because I need to keep try to keep track of all the characters. I need to make a list. If somebody has a list of all the characters that have ever come out, please send them to me. I need help with that. I love you. I hope you love yourself. And I hope to see you at a live show. If not, I'll see you at the watering hole on the astral plane.